Okay, so this is the 40th lecture in a 41 lecture series about creating international sustainable civilization. So this uh, lecture uh, came to my mind because a scholar in Indonesia said that he had heard or that he knew that Aristotle was not a demo Democrat, it's not in favor of democracy. So uh, Mark Meadows actually said something like, actually a flourishing society is more important than a democracy, <laughs> which in theory, you know, Aristotle would say the best society is one where people are flourishing. It could be a monarchy, could be an aristocracy, it could be a constitutional government, but uh, I am sure Aristotle would say that America, given its history and everything else, a constitutional government fits us best. Um, and we can lose it because the real difference in our society is a healthy democracy and an unhealthy democracy. And so in a healthy democracy, People are self-controlled and temp and generous. And then from there, they develop the virtues. They weave themselves together. They create a middle class. The people who are elected uh, make laws, apply them, distribute uh, services, tax the rich, do what they need to do to create and sustain a middle class. Um, and then they take turns ruling and being ruled. An unhealthy democracy, uh, people are greedy and um, wicked and uh, self-indulgent. They don't trust each other. They don't have good will toward each other. They use the system to get as much pleasure, wealth, power, glory, whatever they want, without any concern for the social well-being. And that leads to a gap between the rich and the poor, instability, and the rise of an authoritarian personality who claims that he can fix the problems. And once he gets in power, he uses his power to help his friends and harm his enemies. This is a classic, absolute description of Donald Trump and of what's been happening in our society. Mark Meadows worked for Donald Trump. So there's no way you should use Aristotle to justify Donald Trump. Um, and Mark Meadows should not be saying such things. But there is a contingent of people, DeSantis, um, who have co-opted Aristotle, Hillsdale. Hillsdale College doesn't take any government money. They are raving, rabid, pro-capitalist. This is not Aristotle at all. I mean, just for starters, a very large inheritance tax. Just for starters, no problem taxing the rich to distribute social goods so that you can have a middle class. Um, Aristotle did not agree with socialism in the sense that no private property but there's just because he didn't agree with no private property does not mean that he was certainly on board with no regulation of the economic system or no taxation uh that is such a false dichotomy in our society and it's shocking to me that professors will buy into this. But I will explain to you what Aristotle thought, the difference between a democracy and a polity. And also there's democracy by lot, and then there's representative democracy. So what we have actually is a polity, but what every country in the world, except North Korea, maybe Cuba, I don't know, but all but very few countries in the whole world have polity, not technically speaking, democracy. 
Um, they don't have democracy by lot. They have representative democracy. Um, but but still, the, the overall principles, the goal of flourishing is the same. And so let me explain um, how I think that should be understood and why the conservatives in the U.S. who are completely corrupted, defending the completely corrupt capitalist, international capitalist corporate system in America. There's no way Aristotle would agree to that. Just the previous lecture has, they've corrupted the human body. They've destroyed our minds. They've destroyed uh, teenagers, character formation. Aristotle was totally obsessed with character formation. So he would definitely want regulations of these devices. There's no question about that. Uh, but Hillsdale College, whatever, will probably say, oh, we believe in uh, moral education, blah, blah, and the liberals don't, blah, blah. Oh, but you can't regulate capitalism because that's socialism. So I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know how they can put those things together. But I can give you my view. And um, I would ask you to remember whatever you identify with Islam, Indonesian identity, any religious tradition, any political ideology, you should know, you know, people read it differently and it can be corrupted. And you have to give arguments for whatever position you have, and you can't assume anything. <laughs> Um, somebody else will take the same words and make it into something totally different. Okay, what is the best type of society? At any one place and time is one where those in power are ruling for the benefit of the ruled. This is measured by the resources the leaders have, their ability to distribute them appropriately, providing opportunities for each citizen to flourish to the highest level possible for as long as possible. Some people need scholarships to get into PhD programs in math, for example, in order to flourish. Most do not. I would not. <laughs> Don't give me money for that. Uh, when it comes to the criminal justice system, everyone should be treated equally with equal access to the legal system and an equally competent, motivated lawyer and an impartial judge or jury. And that's what we don't have. Money can buy you um, an acquittal and lack of money can fail to give you, um, will lead to a conviction. The best societies are those where some rulers are elected and others are appointed. To my knowledge, every so-called democracy in the world has this type of system. Aristotle calls this a polity because it's not a democracy, not a democracy by lot where citizens are chosen randomly to sit on the assembly. It's not a representative democracy where citizens vote for legislators who make the laws for them. What we call a democracy, Aristotle would call a polity. Even though a polity is best in theory or on paper or in the form of its constitution, there are some nations at some times in their history um, that are better as at monarchies or aristocracies rather than democracies. So uh, I would argue that in Jordan, although they're having problems, um, that the aristocracy, at least until recently, the aristocracy was better than having an election because if they had an election, they would get Islamicists and they wouldn't, they would have a very uh, theocracy, a very authoritarian theocracy. So um, for Aristotle, there's six types of government, rule of one person, one family, the, mon the rule of a group of families who inherit political party, and a constitutional government, the rule of the major majority of citizens who elect their officials. The government is just when the rulers use their power for the benefit of the ruled. 
A government is unjust when the rulers use their power to help their friends and harm their enemies and focus on consolidating power permanently. In nations with one ruling family, the government is a monarchy when the ruler is just and a tyranny when the ruler is unjust. When there's a group of families that govern, the society is an aristocracy when they are just and an oligarchy, rule of the rich, when it is unjust. When there's a constitutional government, the majority of the citizens determine public policy by voting. When the citizens are self-controlled and generous, especially, but also virtuous and have practical wisdom, the society is a healthy democracy. When the citizens are self-indulgent and greedy, and they use their voting power to manipulate the system for their personal pleasure, power, wealth, or glory, this is an unhealthy democracy usually leads to instability and the rise of an authoritarian personality. In any given society at any given time, there's one best government, but this can change. It does change. Historically, many nations have moved from monarchies and aristocracies to representative democracies or republics or constitutional governments, but they really are polities. We should make those distinctions. The most important way to preserve stability is to make sure the ruling class is educated in the norms of the society. Most of all, they should be taught to use their privilege for the benefit of those over whom they rule. It's very important, right, that the ruling class get educated to rule for the benefit of the ruled. Otherwise, if they abuse their part, power, the society will become unstable which could lead to their overthrow or a more difficult situation for them to be effective. Um, societies today that want to move toward democracies or polities need to focus on public education for everyone. This education has to include learning the not getting the knowledge necessary to compete in the economic sector. And the economic sector is ex it exists right at the time and as it's anticipated to exist in the next decade. So that's a big deal in global um, for every country right now, because you do want your people to succeed in, in technology. But does that, that doesn't mean every single student today needs to learn tech the tech sector. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there's a certain level of probably technological skills that, that every future uh, employee will need, but they also need the arts, they need humanities. It's just, you need a curriculum where you can balance it out and where you have programs for your present students that would actually enable them to function, the intellectual virtues and STEM, the economic related virtues to compete in the economic system need to be tied to the moral virtues so that wisdom guides the economic system. Um, the goal of liberal arts, um, the, the really every country would need liberal arts education the goal of liberal arts education is to liberate the minds of students from the biases and narrowness of the families they grew up in and free them to think about the lives of everyone in their nation and today in the world. Today, a liberal education has to discuss the human condition, what we all have in common, how to flourish, what dangers to watch out for, to prevent corruption and decline toward authoritarianism. Students need to know about this is the seventh stage of globalization. What's happened in the past? Um, how can we prevent some of the worst results of previous globalization transitions of economies of the global economic uh, sphere? And Jeffrey Sachs has a nice book about that. Practical wisdom is Aristotle anti-democratic. Aristotle explains all the virtues a human being needs in order to deliberate well, to be able to make the best choices in the many, many types of situation any leader confronts each day. 
A person with practical wisdom has all the personal virtues, social virtues, political virtues, and can also deliberate well. When faced with a situation, she can accurately describe the choice that needs to be made, set out all the possible attainable options, no unattainable ideals, um, no cynical rejection of a positive way forward, which, which option is best and why. Then be able to convince everyone involved to do what is necessary to achieve the goal. This person must know what experts to call in to be able to make the best choice. In a flourishing society, every citizen would have many chances to engage in deliberation as they cre create and manage various social and political networks of people coming together to create a flourishing society. While engaged in deliberation, some people would stand out as better at this skill. All the, you know, the skill of practical wisdom requires all sorts of other moral and intellectual virtues. These people should be promoted, given more chances to make decisions that have more impact on more people or that have a huge impact on the nation. The public needs to be educated so that corrupt political candidates cannot claim to have practical wisdom and then, when elected, to use their power to help friends and harm enemies. This is very common today and it's undermining societies. Western colonialists used Aristotle to justify their oppression. That's why, you know, I could understand why a Muslim uh, in, um, why an Indonesian would think maybe I'm part of the colonial process. Um, I would say that uh, people, you know, um, young people who go uh, to the West to get educated and get educated in um, deconstruction or in enlightenment um, perspectives, that those are the perspectives that were used primarily to justify colonialism in the sense of exploitation of natural resources and um, uh, and social engineering of people. But Aristotle was used, there's no question there. Um, and then that's why I say, you know, that this is, well, all the lectures have an interpretation of Aristotle that I have supported with evidence and that I have acknowledged at every point has been abused, could be abused now, is being abused uh, within our, my country. And I would gather is abused, could be, is being abused abroad. But what I'm more aware of, again, because it stands out to me, is that enlightenment postmodern views are also used. And so um, people in developing countries need to be savvy and critical thinkers. And they need to say, okay, Erica, Aristotle could be used to justify colonialism, but this is the interpretation that I take from it uh, based on my own reading, based on uh, Martha Beck's lectures and her references. Uh, if you include the Robert Lustig talking about our food system and um, Gabor Mate talking about our mental, they refer to Aristotle. So certainly if all of those professionals do, then you don't have to take the word of uh, political operatives who have plenty of other agendas um, and or, or other academics who maybe have good intentions, but maybe don't, you know, hard to know. Um, personally, um, so Aristotle has been used to justify colonialism. They claim the indigenous people were by nature inferior incapable of the highest levels of wisdom and intelligence. They refused to educate them, creating the appearance that this was true. So it's a sort of a self-confirming culture. Culture, you know, culture tends to self, engage in self-reference. It's hard to get outside 
of the norms and find natural standards, which I do try to do in these lectures. Personally, I think it's easier to modify and apply Aristotle today than it is to continue to use John Locke or utilitarianism to justify Western capitalism's presence in developing nations. The cause of the Asian economic crisis was the application of modern ideas, minimal political interference in the economy, exploitation of natural res resources. God wants us to use the land um, to become prosperous for human beings with no limit, okay? This view, those views continue, or utilitarianism, we just treat people like herd animals, give them pleasures and pains. So, you know, corporations deliberately hack the dopamine system and then say, well, we're just, you know, people are free. They can choose, you know, whatever they want, but <laughs> you've already, capitalism has already manipulated them into taking pleasure in dopamine related rewards. So when utilitarianism arose, even with Bentham, um, his idea was as long as it doesn't hurt somebody else. And the trouble is today with environmental problems, every decision we make has an impact on everybody else and on the next generation. He didn't live at a time when the, everything was as the, when the stakes were so high, when people were aware that the destruction of the earth does have impact on future generations, completely oblivious to that. Um, didn't He didn't live in a system where um, people would buy food and it was literally, uh, it was created to become addictive. <laughs> you know, I don't think that the... That's not what he was thinking about, for sure. And um, the cause of the Asian economic, you have to remember that. It was modern ideas that caused that. This view continues to destroy the resources of developing nations and prevent taxation that would be used to educate the indigenous people. Um, today in the U.S., there's been a reemergence of scholarship and college curricula based on Aristotle, that it is indeed a return to Western domination. It even rejects efforts in the U.S. to treat non-whites, women, et cetera, as equals, all in the name of, quote, preserving the Western heritage. It's so corrupt, it makes no distinction between Aristotle's spiritual humanism and modern materialist, rationalist, dualist humanism. Freedom means billionaires not having to pay taxes. Equality means electing a president with no experience, no personal or social virtue, and no interest in exercising practical wisdom. But he had equal opportunity to be elected. And why did he get elected? Because of political rhetoric. That was, uh, Plato said, the sophists taught persuasive thinking, persuasive speech, and that's what ruined Athens. A major factor that ruined Athens is that the voters could not tell the difference between Socrates and a sophist um, because the educated elite were using rhetoric and Socrates was not. And they had gotten used to having their emotional buttons punched, their dopamine and their cortisol. Um, and so when Socrates refused to do it, they got mad at him and he didn't make them feel good. He didn't flatter them. So he got condemned as the corrupter. Um, so many professionals in the U.S. are crying out about the corrupting influence of the modern view with no limits on capitalism and the use of science to destroy people and also to destroy nature. They're turning back. They are turning back to Aristotle also. Obviously, they make a huge distinction between the wisdom traditions and modernity. So that there you have it. There's people who say we have to return to uh, the, the Western heritage. And they, they're, they refer to Aristotle, but they're actually uh, protecting American capitalism. Um, whereas people trained in modern thinking are 
uh, crying out about the abuse of science and social science, social engineering, and they're looking back to Aristotle as a way out of this, Aristotle's idea of flourishing. So, so just like with Confucius Analects, our founding fathers wanted it to preserve and develop our democracy. Xi Jinping wants it to uh, preserve and develop his own very centralized authoritarian government. So, okay, why should I not be surprised? Okay. Indonesia, Panchasila, and democracy. Indonesians surely have the same problems as everyone else. Political candidates that claim to have practical wisdom, that claim to follow Panchasila, but they use their power to help their friends and harm their enemies. That's why I like being a college teacher. I can at least trigger the desire for critical thinking in my students. The students should not feel discouraged or give up because they do not have power. The ability to think clearly about political issues, to develop practical wisdom, is what it takes to preserve democracy. They can always model such thinking, organize opportunities for others to do so, and do what we all depend on each other to do to preserve our free societies. What more can anyone want from life than to educate current college students to create a better future. Those with power have a lot of limitations on what they might want to do for many reasons. Educators don't have limits. They can seek truth and wisdom all day in every way once they get tenure and model this to students. That is their lifelong in impact, even if it is unmeasurable. So I would encourage the courses with students in it to think as a student, what do you want to come away with? How do you want to be a visionary in whatever sector of society that you anticipate going into? How do you want to uh, think about public affairs, talk to other people, to, to constantly educate yourself and each other so that you can think like a citizen? And in the course I'm teaching that has colleagues at UN Islamic State Universities. They can, uh, I speak as a colleague about what more do you want than talking to students about Panchasila and about moderate Islam, humanistic Islam, the humanistic branch of the other traditions, the way that we can weave ourselves together and also the fundamental cornerstone that there's no way anyone living a spiritual life could justify using carbon and destroying the earth. If there's one thing that should seem pretty obvious and the very fact that these people who want to get back to traditional Western culture have no problem with that, that's a, that's nothing they pay attention to because they're so obsessed with protecting a free economy is pretty scary and pretty obviously wrong. It might be tragic good intentions, but after a while it's willed ignorance and I think they're accountable. And then some of them I think are just plain old corrupt. And they, they like the fact that their schools can survive if they protect a free market because um, the fossil fuel billionaires who are controlling our political system also are trying to control our academic system. They're setting up um, endowed positions in economics that will bring higher people who are rabid, uh, no intervention in the free market. Uh, edu uh, economic PhDs. I mean, they have a plan, but this is not Aristotle. And um, I don't know if some of them think it is or if they're just cynical, but whatever it is, it's corrupt. And that's, I hope developing countries, I hope academics in developing countries call this out 
because their countries are really being and have been negatively affected by all of this.